Sigurd Johnson from Iceland. So he's a great plastic surgeon and he will tell us everything about his experience um, and his center. So here he's coming. Hello, doctor. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you, Blanche. So where are you right now? Are you in Iceland? I'm in Reykjavik, Iceland, yes, at my uh, uh, private clinic here uh, in the center of uh, Reykjavik. So uh, uh, we're done for the day. It's been a really quiet weeks now, mm -hmm. the past three or four weeks with no surgery at all because of the coronavirus. But uh, we uh, uh, are hoping to, to uh, be operating fully again uh, in the beginning of May. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and over there in Iceland, I read that the, the, it is quite well managed, uh, apparently. So it might be okay compared to other yes we 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 we, uh, we sought through a, a very uh, strict policy with all mm -hmm. of the people coming from abroad tourists and icelanders coming back from abroad everybody went on two weeks quarantine mm -hmm. and uh, we have done a lot of testing uh, mm -hmm. probably the most testing in the world per capita this is it's, what i uh, yeah yeah, so, so, um, and uh, the police is actually a team with the police is actually tracing all of the infections. Mm -hmm. So, and and targeting people that are uh, should be in quarantine. So, so it's a lot of work done by the by the police and the health uh, uh, administrators. Great. So you will be able to to go back to surgeries probably quite soon, then. Hopefully, they, we uh, we were thinking about you know having closed until June, but now we're we're because of the uh, the pandemic in, in Iceland isn't so severe. They are talking about uh, beginning with elective surgery already in the beginning of May. Okay, good. Um, so I would like you to present uh, yourself a little bit. Your your path until now and um, your experience with transgender surgeries and also I know you, you used to work or maybe you still work in, in another country so yes I, I still work in Sweden I uh, uh, I am 40 years old mm -hmm. and uh, started in plastic surgery 10 years ago uh, after my residency in general surgery here in Iceland and uh, I moved abroad to Stockholm Mm -hmm. uh, in Sweden to do my plastic surgery residency where I and I lived in Stockholm with my family for uh, nine years and we just relocated back from Stockholm to Reykjavik uh, last summer uh, okay. and uh, I work uh, I have a private clinic here in Reykjavik and I work mm -hmm. at the uh, university hospital here in Iceland in Reykjavik and then I work uh, at least one week a month in Stockholm at the Karolinska University Hospital, um, the, the biggest university hospital in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have been doing transgender surgery for almost 10 years now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we saw a huge increase in patient numbers when uh, I was starting my residency in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an opportunity for me uh, with uh, going into transgender surgery and, and really early on in my residency, I, I got a huge interest for that. Uh, so that has been my main focus the last years. And uh, I've been doing a lot of research as well uh, on transgender surgery. And I, I did a PhD, which I finished in 2016 on transgender surgery. And then after that, it has evolved. I've been traveling around the world for, for, for example, Sapphire uh, to teach other surgeons mm -hmm. to uh, uh, implant your devices. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a, a really uh, fun 10 years of transgender surgery. So what kind of surgeries uh, do, you, do you perform actually for transgender uh, patients? Uh, basically, I, I do both 
uh, female to male and male to female. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both masculine lysis surgery and feminine sizing surgery. Uh, and uh, the, the big surgeries like uh, uh, phalloplasties and vaginoplasties I do in the university hospitals on, on both Icelandic and, and Swedish patients. Uh, and then uh, what I can do at my private clinic are uh, smaller surgeries like mastectomies for transgender males and uh, uh, secondary surgery after vaginoplasty and last but not least implantation of, uh, of devices for phalloplasty. Okay. okay. Um, ca can you tell us a little bit about the techniques you, you, you maybe you use or you prefer for the phalloplasty and the vaginoplasty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do mostly penile inversion vaginoplasty. Uh, and with uh, an addition of scrotal skin, if it's needed. Mm -hmm. For uh, phalloplasty, I've done mostly uh, ALT and radial forearm flap, which are the most common flaps mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even more of the, of the ALT in the later years. Okay. So there, there are, there's a trend moving towards, I think, to doing more ALT with a more conspicuous scar and uh, tissue that is more reliable, is thicker skin. So an ALT has, has clear advantages mm -hmm. in that. But uh, on the other side, radial forearm flap is still uh, 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 probably still the gold standard for phalloplasty mm -hmm. uh, because of the availability of nerves and, and that, the, that the skin uh, and the f subcutaneous fatty layer beneath the skin mm -hmm. is, uh, in most cases, not that thick. I see. That, that can be a problem in the ALT. Absolutely. Uh, ALT flaps, yeah. So do you, do you choose the phalloplasty, the kind of, of technique according to the patient's desire? Or what are your... Um, how do you... Yeah. The, the, the patient desire is, is the first question uh, what does the patient want and uh, what does the patient not want and and uh, I go through a series of questions discussing with the patients what what do they really want from their their uh, uh, phalloplasties what are they and uh, excuse me well, yeah you, you go through the the expectations of the patient exactly yeah uh, and and then then you choose together with the patient the the uh, appropriate operating technique. I see. And we have a lot of questions about the urethral lengthening. So I wonder, mm -hmm. as, as a plastic surgeon, actually, uh, if if you perform a urethral lengthening or not, or what who, what is your position with this? Mm. Yeah, uh, we, we do urethral lengthening, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. m most of the cases when the patient uh, desires urethral lengthening and the ability to pee and standing, mm -hmm. we use the radial mm -hmm. forearm flap. But uh, I've also used the skip flap uh, from the groin uh, mm -hmm. as uh, for urethral lengthening. Uh, but Actually, the, the reality in Sweden has been uh, in the last years that many patients are choosing not to get urethral lengthening. Okay. And th that is because of the fact of uh, a, a, a very high uh, percentage of complications with urethral lengthening. Mm -hmm. and, th there we, and there we go back in again to... Uh, to discuss the the desire and the expectations the patient has for its phalloplasty. You can get a very good phalloplasty, which uh, is uh, aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. uh, with a glansplasty and, and the right size for the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the look can get very good. And functionally, can also get very good with a good implant. Mm -hmm. So, with uh, if you do a scrotoplasty as well, and and uh, uh, 
put in testicle implants and uh, and then a uh, rectal implant uh, uh, you can get a really good and functioning phalloplasty mm -hmm. but you still have to pee sitting okay but but uh, and it's it's a, it's a, it's a measurement that the patient has to uh, decide for himself am i willing to uh, take the risk of being in and out of hospital for uh, the next years mm -hmm. uh, doing corrective surgery for my urethra and the risk of getting uh, urinary, urinary uh, tract infection, uh, etc. So, mm -hmm. so uh, and a lot of uh, the Swedish patients have been, have decided on that, not to get a, a urethra lengthening I see. in the last years. And do you, we had a question uh, when we when we announced your interview, we had a question from a German patient about, uh, well, he had surgery somewhere, he didn't say where, but he he had urethral lengthening and he has so many problems with uh, urethra and fistulas and everything. So do you also correct this kind of problems coming from outside of your clinic when, when they appear? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, 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 the, the we just have to plan very carefully mm -hmm. if we do correction surgery on a urethral fistula or, or stenosis. So with the right uh, X-rays and and uh, <clears throat> urodynamic uh, uh, research before mm -hmm. hand, but that is that is uh, absolutely done here at my clinic. I see. Uh, so we had a question about my colleague uh, who is asking if you do uh, also metalgioplasty. I I actually uh, I haven't done so many metalgioplasties. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two centers that are very active in Sweden, and we uh, decided a long time ago that uh, uh, we would focus on phalloplasty, and the other center would focus on metalgioplasty. Uh, however, when you're doing uh, a uh, uh, phalloplasty with urethral lengthening, you kind of do a metaideoplasty mm -hmm. while you're doing it. So, so uh, I have done some metaideoplasties, but but no, that's not uh, that has not been a main focus. Okay, I see. And about urethral lengthening, we just received two questions. So what, the first one is, can the urethral lengthening that has been created be placed back to its original spot without too much complication or post void drip? Mm. Yeah, we, we have actually done a few, quite, uh, quite a few cases of that where, where uh, the patient has had problems with the urethral lengthening is tired of the problems and just wants, wants it solved once and for all. And then we do mm -hmm. a, a, a traditional urethrostomy uh, beneath the scrotum. So you just get a urethral opening beneath the scrotum and you pee whilst, while sitting again. Okay, and it's not generating any um, big complications. It no, it actually shouldn't, and and uh, and post voidal dripping and and such can be addressed with medication as well. Okay. So you don't don't okay. always need op, uh, a surgical solution for that. I see. I see. So I think uh, we have a, a next patient of yours who is saying, "I can tell that I'm very happy with my urethral lengthening surgery. I did get a repair surgery, and I'm very happy with the results. So thank you." That's good. Mm -hmm. good feedback. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, um, the implants. Uh, do you do you, well? You you offered to to make a tour of the clinic. So do you want to do it now or do you? Yeah, the clinic. Yeah, it's uh, it's as I said located in uh, in the center of Reykjavik, and uh, uh, here's uh, the office, and and we are three plastic surgeons. Uh, working here, uh, one uh, educated in Sweden as myself, and then one uh, uh, a female plastic surgeon educated in uh, 
in uh, France, in Strasbourg. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our waiting room here. And uh, this is the name of our clinic. The Amitika okay. Dia was the, I think, the, 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 the goddess of beauty from mm -hmm. the Greek mythology. And then we have these uh, corridors here with uh, small operating uh, rooms and uh, and the rooms for uh, interviews and and uh, for talking to patients and then the and then the uh, our pride here is the is the brand new operating theater uh, here we do uh, small, uh, we take the shooters out and uh, talk to the patients here and then here is our operating theater very beautiful Icelandic landscape? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, a part of of Reykjavik here in the mountains. Yes. Very, very nice. Yes. It's very rare actually for patients to be able to see the operating room before they, they get the operation. Oh. You need to go back to the office to hear me. Yes, I was saying thank you for the tour because it's very rare that patients you don't hear. I can't hear you. I can't. maybe maybe I, they can hear me live on Facebook. I don't know, but yes. I can't hear you, Blanche. Now, okay. Problem. What should we do? <laughs> okay? Should we? Could you, should we close it down and restart? Okay, or... you can close it down. Yes. Yeah. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about all of you, you who are listening to us. We we already had this small problem before, so so we will wait for the doctor to come back to us. And if you have any questions, you can ask them. I also have many many questions for this doctor. I was with him in Lyon, in France, last year for some surgeries. So here he is again. Can you hear me? So you're back on the live. One, zero. Here you are. Yes. Great, great, great. yes. So I was uh, thanking you for showing us the room because it's not so easy for patients to be able to see operating rooms before surgery. So I think it's nice yeah. for them to be able to, to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we received a question from Kyle who is saying, do you make as well MLD phalloplasty? Like from the, uh, the big dorsus? Uh, I've done uh, very few cases, but uh, we like the ALT and the radial forearm flaps better. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done a lot of those okay. uh, before. So you most focus on the on the on the leg and the on the arm. Yeah. So question about the implant from Jonah. So I propose before um, before we answer this question that you talk a, a little bit about your experience with this uh, well with the Zephyr implants and in malleable and inflatable one in both countries. And also, if you can tell us uh, if you if you had experience with other uh, kind of devices, actually other than the fear. Uh, yes, we, we before Sapphire came on the market, we uh, uh, we were using uh, uh, AMS, mm -hmm. Ampicore, and, and Spectra. Okay. Uh, and uh, had we, we weren't totally satisfied so so uh, we were uh, very interested when uh, sapphire the uh, sapphire implants came on the market mm -hmm. and started using them quite early we were first uh, among the first ones to use it in the world in 2015 or 16 16 yes absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you started with the malleable one we started with the uh, malleable one and i have a uh, uh, a dummy, a test copy of that, and uh, we have most. I have most experience with that, mm -hmm. uh, with the malleable, uh, and uh, and the and the and the biggest advantage of this uh, implant is the the plate. I think mm -hmm. uh, because uh, 
the other ones, the other erectile implants that were uh, designed for uh, uh, cisgender biological males, uh, they weren't suitable in my opinion because uh, there was so much instability of the implant. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, creating uh, uh, you know, a, a sex life that wasn't you know, functioning uh, uh, with penetration and it was creating problems with erosion so I think it's a, a big advantage if you if you can get the implant really stable. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other advantage I see is is the width of the implant is mm -hmm. you know w w when you when you need it, sometimes you need the width for the phalloplasty. Uh, then it's very good to have, and it's very you know you can always uh, reduce the width if you need it. And there's also uh, in your assortment, a, a narrower, yeah, exactly. It's a narrow, uh, it's a yeah. regular, regular size, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's really, really important in beforehand to choose the right size or mm -hmm. the width of the implant. Uh, <clears throat> so because erosion, you know, the implant coming out is, is a big problem for all erectile implants, also for cisgender men. Mm -hmm. So, so it's really important to to discuss with the patient and and uh, 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 get a size that is fitting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how do you how do you attach the the plate to the pubic bone? Uh, I attach the plate with uh, non-absorbable sutures mm -hmm. uh, like proline or or uh, uh, etibond. So, so really strong sutures. Mm -hmm. And it takes probably around uh, uh, six to 12 weeks for the body's own scarring, you know, to get even tighter mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with a, a scar capsule around the implant. So you get the scar capsule around every implant you put in the body. And, and this uh, it takes a few months to get, get strong. So okay. that, is, that is also uh, uh, important to keep in mind, you know, when you're the first weeks not to start too early with to manipulate it what is your recommendation how many weeks uh, should the patient wait before using the device i tell my patients to wait with manipulating for six weeks, six weeks. you know mm -hmm. yeah preferably don't touch it just leave it in a in a natural position your phalloplasty mm -hmm. and uh, and let it heal let it scar and after that you can slowly begin to manipulate it and and stretch the skin of your phalloplasty you know uh, and and get get the position you you wanted to be from day to day uh, and and daily life I mean that's it, also a, a, a big uh, uh, aspect of of malleable implants you have to be comfortable with them uh, in time but it takes time for everything to heal and uh, and uh, uh, and you shouldn't start too early with manipulation or 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 uh, having sex with it. Yeah, it could it it might damage the 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 sutures actually on the pubic bone and move the device inside. Exactly. Yeah, that is the main main concern. Mm -hmm. uh, it's. Yeah. It can, of course, get a little loose mm -hmm. somewhere and a little bit, you know, mobility. If it's just a few millimeters, mm -hmm. one lifting somewhere, you know, it isn't the end of the world. You, you, you could live with it or you can go back in, inside in surgery in a small half an hour surgery, put mm -hmm. some sutures back. Okay. Yeah. And this would be a general surgery, uh, I mean, general anesthesia or a local for this, um, this restructuring? That probably can, can be done in local, but I, I actually always uh, use general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. And able to answer a question you received about it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've done a, a, a few cases of the, mal of the inflatable. 
and uh, it, it's a uh, it's also a good implant with the advantage of uh, yeah I have one myself here a dummy but we'll use yours yeah, yeah. this cost a lot of money so uh, and the advantage, of course, is the is the uh, aspect of it being inflatable, so you don't have to manage uh, a half erection, you know, which you can which you can have when you have a malleable implant. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it has also the advantage of the plate, yeah. uh, as you can show here, which the malleable has as well, and. Uh, it has an advantage of uh, the pump being shaped as the as a testicle, mm -hmm. so so you use that uh, instead of a a, a prosthetic uh, testicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't have uh, all three tests like uh, three testes, or one no. test is way smaller than the than the other one. Yeah, but you know biologically. One of the testicles with with cisgender men is uh, very often a little bit smaller than the other. So so I present this to my patients as a non problem and and encourage them to get just one uh, prosthetic testicle and then this one in the in the other scrotum. I see. And when you do the glansoplasty, do you is it really helping for you to 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 design the glans or or not specifically? It doesn't hurt mm -hmm. to have it, I think. If it's not too wide and big and and uh, pushing on the phalloplasty. Mm -hmm. In some cases, I have had to, uh, and that's that's a good advantage of, of the silicone glands on the implants, that you can reduce the size of it. So in some cases, I have done that. Okay. But... Uh, 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 and the, the maybe the main advantage for the patient is you get a a really good stiffness in the glands. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, uh, it doesn't get droopy like a snoopy deformity on the glands. Uh, uh, so so yeah, I, I wouldn't change that on the implant. I would still have it on okay. if I were to decide. Yeah. So it's a good news because. Actually, probably next year we will have uh, removable glands, but you will be able to choose according to the focus yeah. if you want yeah. to use or if you want mm -hmm. something more plain, yeah. so it's not so so big. That's good. So we received a question from uh, Jonas, who is asking, how is the success success rate with the pump at Karolinska? I've heard different rumors about. Uh, sorry, I've heard different rumors around. It is that it has been stopped. It's the fun. Yeah, we we have done a few cases on uh, at Karolinska, and uh, we have had not many, maybe maybe three or four of them of the inflatables, uh, and we have had to take in one or two out. So. So the the uh, because of problems with uh, 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 infection, one and mm -hmm. then uh, uh, a problem with uh, uh, the implantation itself, which mm -hmm. was pushing uh, too much on the on the flask phalloplasty. So it was a security procedure yeah. not to damage the phalloplasty. I see. And the patient got a, 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 a malleable instead. Okay. Um, so so, but in general, erectile devices are there are high rates of complications. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, that's also for cisgender men, not only transgender. And uh, I think just with experience and uh, development of devices. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when the surgeons get uh, more used to operating and uh, and uh, are uh, uh, interested and and uh, seek uh, to others that have been implanting the same devices or similar devices, I think we will get better and the rates of complications will go down. 
uh, but uh, 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 another aspect with uh, inflatable devices is that there are more components in the device itself that can break, as to say, you know, you can get a hole in the water reservoir, you can get uh, uh, a malfunction of the of the tubes. Uh, so, uh, so probably uh, the rates of uh, the rate the rate of complication will be lower uh, with uh, the malleable devices. And we actually uh, we published a study uh, in the uh, journal Sexual Medicine last year. Me and uh, the guys from uh, uh, the New University Hospital in Amsterdam on the Sapphire 100 malleable device. Uh, and the results are, are very promising, you know, uh, 93%, almost everybody of uh, those who still had the device at the end of the follow-up time could, were, were, uh, uh, had good sexual function. Mm -hmm. So, right. so when we, when we can get the implant to stay in, when there's no problem of infection or, or, uh, mobilization of the implant or, or uh, uh, other problems, it really can function very well. And the results are really positive, uh, if you say these numbers. Uh, this this uh, study is available, right, on the web, so yeah, yeah. Some people can, can have a look mm. at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thank you for that. And we received other questions. Um, one is, how long will I need to stay at the hospital after the surgery? Uh, actually, we do this as a day operation. Uh, so, so you come in in the morning, seven or eight a.m. in the morning, and uh, then we do the surgery. Uh, and it takes. Sorry. Sorry, we are talking about the implantation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, and you come in the morning and. Uh, uh, and we do the surgery, it takes about 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, and then you rest at the clinic, maybe two, three, four hours. Uh, and I put a lot of local anesthetics. So most patients do not uh, wake up in pain. Mm -hmm. They go home, home uh, or to the hotel, the, those patients that come from abroad uh, with pain medication. So uh so you don't need an overnight stay okay at the That's clinic okay and, uh, yeah okay and i i received another question about about this um about patients coming from abroad abroad is your clinic able to help navigate new patients from the usa to get surgery this is the first question, and then there is another, another yeah. one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we actually, uh, I actually uh, operated a couple of patients from North America last year, uh, last fall in my clinic. So they came from uh, uh, the US and Canada and mm. uh, 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 came to the country a few days before, uh, did a little bit sightseeing in Iceland. And uh, then stayed for, uh, the, yeah, you have to stay maybe for five to seven days after the surgery before you can fly again. Uh, oh, so sorry? It's not so much. I mean, it's, no. it's not two, three weeks. Yeah. No. This so, and, and, we, and my clinic here, we can help with uh, uh, finding a hotel nearby. We have lots of hotels uh, in the proximity. Uh, you get all the prescription medicine if you come from abroad from us directly. Uh, and we have a follow-up directly the day after and then uh, uh, before you go home. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, from the patients from who come from abroad, I uh, uh, do virtual consults mm -hmm. on FaceTime or Skype. Uh, and uh, uh, so I can take a look at the operating area mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, discuss with the patients if, if there are any problems or if everything's going fine. Okay, that's great. So the patient doesn't have to come first to Iceland to have the first um, 
the first meeting and then go back to his country and come back for surgery. It's all before um, through internet. Then yeah. he, he goes back home. And then I guess you have some post, uh, post-op follow-up with uh, Skype or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So from, for those who come uh, to Iceland, to me, from abroad, I do a virtual. First, uh, we begin with emails. We okay. send a little bit of emails back and forth, and I get a little bit of information. And mm-hmm. then we do our virtual consult. I need uh, 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 to see the phalloplasty and uh, hear your story, mm-hmm. and uh, and then uh, work us through uh, in cooperation in what which device we want to choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, uh, those who come from abroad have to go to their health clinic or their family doctor to get a blood test mm-hmm. and an MRSA swab I see. clinic or the family doctor. Mm-hmm. And do you also receive patients for their phalloplasty to make the fa- to, to create the phalloplasty in Iceland? No, uh, unfortunately not. Uh, I'm I'm exclusively doing. Icelandic and Swedish patients for the big surgery and the reason for that is that you need uh, uh, all this equipment like a microscopy uh, that are only available at uh, the the university hospitals in Iceland and Sweden. Okay, so you can use patients from abroad for uh, some revisions maybe for erythra revisions and implantation. Yes, Okay. exactly, yeah. I see. Uh, I have another question about how many years have you had experience doing phalloplasty? Well, you already said that. Maybe the person was not connected. I I did my first phalloplasty in 2012. And maybe maybe in the last years we were doing maybe 10, 12, 15 phalloplasties a year. Okay. Okay. Um, Implantations, how many many years do you do? do Both? Um, you know, totally, we've probably done around, yeah, we do maybe, uh, we've done maybe 25, 30 uh, of the sapphire uh, malleable ones, uh, and then a few uh, of the inflatable, and then we have done a lot of the AMS malleable implants before that. So we also, I also started that in 2012, so eight years now. Eight years. Uh, I have a question here. Do you have any information about how the one diabetes could influence the outcome of phalloplasty, specifically the nerve hookup and erotic sensations? Yeah, uh, diabetes. Yes. Yes. Uh, mm, um, you know, if, if the diabetes is well controlled, then it uh, it shouldn't really be a problem but uh, mm-hmm. uh, patients with diabetes statistically have a higher uh, rate of complications mainly wound healing problems uh, infection uh, and uh, probably also the the uh, the healing of nerves and sensitivity but i think i think the main uh, point is is that if the if the diabetes is well controlled, it shouldn't be uh, uh, that a bigger risk factor. Okay, thank you. Very much. Um, I have another question here, which is like well, it's, it's a specific case. I had phalloplasty over two years ago, and urethra lengthening in October, so last October. How long do I have to wait until I can have the implant? And he says he had alt um, and lives in Sweden actually. Mm. I I always say one year, okay. at least one year after uh, the last phalloplasty operation. Okay, so it's a good news because you probably uh, surgeries will not really surgeries in other countries will not probably start before September, <laughs> maybe in Sweden. Yeah, but the problem is we have huge waiting lists everywhere. 
my questions also. Yeah. Yeah. So so that that is that is the main main factor, you know, delaying everything for transgender patients. We are we are too few transgender surgeons and uh, and uh, uh, the availability of uh, operating theaters uh, and uh, hospital beds are haltering you know uh, the the volume we can do so so it's not it's not uncommon to have from one year to two three years waiting list for phalloplasty i see so for people who would like implantation for example that who would have to wait for six more months? Maybe they should already um, contact contact you for for the first um, meeting, I guess. Absolutely, but, but those numbers I mentioned uh, were for the big operation for the phalloplasty original operation. So and okay. and in most clinics you have a much shorter waiting time for other surgery, smaller surgery like implantation. Okay. Uh, more or less the, the waiting the waiting time for implantation for now uh, at my clinic at my private clinic here it's about six months okay uh, and uh, at my hospitals uh, where I work in in, uh, in Reykjavik and in Stockholm it's about one year okay good so Jonas you know what you have to do you have to call the secretary yeah. Um, Jonas probably knows probably. and has called them, yeah. Uh, so I had several questions about the costs. I guess it really depends on the cases. So can can I put you in contact with the the persons asking for the costs uh, for yeah. people abroad after, after the interview? Absolutely. You can... Uh, uh, my email address is hannes at deamedica.is. So everybody is free to send me an email. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Uh, so I had another question. Uh, I don't find it here. So great. Uh, we had some some many questions. I have a question also from uh, from Albert asking if you have any contact in Switzerland. Well, you know us, uh, obviously, but mm. I don't know what he means. By that, maybe other surgeons. Uh, surgery. I probably know some <laughs> surgeons from Switzerland, but I can't remember their names. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe if, is he asking about something specific? Maybe if he hears us, he will be able to to write again the, the yeah. question. The question. Mm. Yes, surgeons. If he yeah. if some surgeons from there. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't remember any names okay. as now. Yeah. Well, Albert, I know some, so I will, I will contact you. <laughs> mm. Great. Um, I don't know if people have more questions. You know, Anis, we have a, a couple of minutes between Facebook and our own conversation. So maybe, yeah, and maybe there will be other, other questions coming here. Um, mm. Right. Do you have any other um, things to, to tell us about the transgender um, surgeries you're performing? Or um, we, we said everything, I think. Yeah, I can uh, maybe tell you about uh, uh, a study we are uh, 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 performing at Karolinska. Mm -hmm. uh, my PhD student, uh, his name is Alexander Kamali. Uh, and my colleagues, we have, are doing one of the largest studies on uh, 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 masculinizing mastectomies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, published until now with uh, almost 500 patients okay. uh, that we photographed before and after, and we registered uh, which technique and, uh, and uh, a lot of demographic factors mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, we are publishing this study as of now. It's uh, we already sent it to a medical journal okay. uh, for publication, uh, and uh, the main points from that study is uh, because we were really focusing on which uh, technique uh, 
is associated with best outcome in relation to uh, complications, uh, operating time, and and therefore and etc. So so and we see we're mainly using three operating techniques: the mm -hmm. the peri areola, which where you make a short scar underneath the areola, mm -hmm. and then we do the double centric uh which is also called the donut technique mm -hmm. and then we have the double incision yes. with a free nipple graft and what we saw that over this this was a 10-year study period and what we saw is that the double incision with free nipple graft was overall the technique that was associated with the lowest rate of complications okay uh, so so that was really really uh, uh Probably something we already knew, but good to to get it confirmed in such a large study. And and uh, alongside this study, we are studying uh, the satisfaction and the quality of life of the patients, and that is the study number two that we're going to publish. Uh, hopefully, at the by the end of this year, uh, okay. is uh, and then. Uh, then we see the, the patient-related outcome measures, how patients uh, uh, feel with their operating technique, mm -hmm. and how satisfied they are. It will, will be very interesting to see. Yes, absolutely. And about studies, do you plan to have a second uh, stage of this, the study you did with the CDSI 100 FTM, uh, maybe in the future? Yeah, we, we have actually talked about it uh, to to do a quality of life and sexual function study mm -hmm. on on the patients that have their uh, malleable implants still inside. Yes. Great, great news. Mm -hmm. uh, so you received some more questions actually. Uh, so Jonas is is saying, is there still a risk if I get the testicular implants to to risk the urethral lengthening? To get worse when it comes to voiding, I'm worried. Uh, uh, no, I've I've, act I've I've actually never seen uh, a complication with the urethral lengthening when you're implanting testicular implants. Mm -hmm. So it's it's we try to stay as far as we can from away from the urethral lengthening, and uh, and just do the uh, testicular implantation. Uh, on the scrotal skin. So it would not squeeze or push the the urethra, actually? No, no. The, the scrotal skin is so soft and pliable uh, that that is... I've never seen that as a problem, no. Okay. And I, I just want to add that what you said about this uh, testicular implant, actually, it's, it's a very small... It's a quite small pump, and around the pump there is this um, very flexible uh, membrane. Mm -hmm. You can inject as much or as as few liquid as as you want. So if you want a very tiny uh, pump unit, you can have a very small one. You don't need a huge testis here. So if if you have a, a small scrotum or a, mm -hmm. the or if there is a worries about having a too big uh, implant inside the, the scrotum. Yeah. And uh, another question uh, about, so it's a, it's a foreign pa patient. I think he's from um, from Canada, but I'm not sure. Uh, Dan Plan, if you want to tell us where you're from. Uh, so he's saying, so surgery is probably won't be starting up till around fall. He's meaning about the, the waiting list, I guess, I guess. Uh, if, if he's asking if the we are starting surgery uh, soon or in the fall, if, yeah. If if he wants, uh, I guess, uh, surgery or implantation. If he calls you now, he might yeah. have the date around fall. Actually, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about uh, the three pieces implant. Uh, do you need scrotoplasty to have the three pieces implant? Uh, yes. Yes, to be able to insert the pump unit. Mm. Without 
without scrotum you don't you you can't place it. yes great so hopefully this uh, virus will let us travel again mm. i want to go to iceland to visit you and yeah. uh, really other other people want so um, i don't have more questions uh, i'm really happy that you gave us your time after your day of work so thank you very much thank and you. Uh, probably we will receive some questions uh, after the live so i will forward you the questions so we can keep answering the people uh, to their questions okay yeah. Great. Great. so thank you very much thank you to all of you who have been uh, watching this live and uh, see you soon around bye bye thank you bye